distinguished ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, allow me to open the working session three on uh, democratic institutions, including democracy at the national, regional, and local levels, and democratic elections. My name is Alexander Schlick. I'm the head of the OCODR election department. Before we go to the two introducers who we are honored to have here at the panel, allow me to remind you that uh, the speakers can only take the floor when we open the floor for statements in the capacity in which they're registered and only entities registered on the speaker's list can be represented. Unless you have already done so, you can register in the speaker's list right behind myself. This working session, as I mentioned, concerns the topic of democratic institutions, including democracy at the national, regional, and local levels, as well as democratic elections. Allow me to start by briefly introducing this session. In the 1990 Charter of Paris, OEC participating states committed to build, consolidate, and strengthen democracy as the only system of government of our nations. OEC participating states recognize that democracy at all levels of government is predicated on political pluralism and the multi-party system. One of the OEC's objectives is to support participating states in creating a regulatory environment in which political parties can effectively perform their essential democratic functions. Good governance, particularly in national representative bodies, such as parliaments, is fundamental to the healthy functioning of democracy. Public accountability and the political credibility of parliaments are cornerstones of a representative democracy. OEC participating states have also committed themselves to upholding key principles of democratic elections as an essential element underpinning genuine democracy. The significance of democratic elections is explicitly recognized in OEC commitments, in particular the 1990 OEC Copenhagen document, and all other OEC commitments reaffirmed in the 2010 Astana Commemorative Declaration, and other international obligations and standards for democratic elections. ODIR's well-established and comprehensive election observation reveals a range of practices and electoral processes across the OEC region. OEC participating states increasingly recognize that election observation is not an end in itself. Its inherent benefit is only realized to the degree that ODIR's assessments and recommendations to improve the conduct of an electoral process are given sufficient consideration and effectively addressed. This session will provide an opportunity for participating states to take stock of progress in the implementation of OEC commitments on democratic governance, political participation, and political pluralism. It will also offer an opportunity to review electoral practices in OEC participating states in compliance with OEC commitments and international obligations and standards, and the implementation of ODIR's recommendations as part of the follow-up process with participating states. You can find specific questions that we hope to address during the session today in the annotated agenda. Allow me to highlight just a handful of those. We would like to focus today on how can legislation and regulations on political parties enhance political pluralism and participation? How can legislative bodies be better safeguarded in the effort to strengthen the democratic balance of power? How can the OECE, and particularly its institutions and field operations, support participating states in ensuring greater political pluralism and participation? We would like to hear what are some of the examples of established and involving good electoral practice concerning suffrage rights, specifically with regard to facilitation of electoral participation of disadvantaged groups, such as persons with disabilities. What can be done to further enhance the effectiveness of follow-up by OEC participating states to ODIA's assessments and recommendations? As I said, we're honored to have two distinguished uh, introducers for this session today. And allow me to say we're also honored to have uh, the director of ODIR at the high panel right here with us. Allow me to introduce the two introducers for this session. The first introducer is Mrs. Evelina Verginova Alexieva Robinson. Mrs. Robinson has been a chair of the Central Election Commission of Bulgaria since March 2014. Before that, she was executive director of the Institute of Modern Politics, a nonprofit organization 
which works in the field of monitoring the legislation according to the principles of transparency, publicity, accountability, and civil participation in decision making. She was an advisor to the Minister of Emergency Situation, a lawyer, a member of the Central Election Commission from 2005. Her professional experience includes advising NGOs working in the field of human rights protection and good governance. Ms. Robinson is an author of analysis and proposals for amendments of the electoral legislation. She participated in civil councils to the parliament, parliamentary committees for the preparation of the election code that is now in force. In roundtables and discussions on electoral matters, in preparation of statements on conducting of the presidential elections in 2011 for constitutional court cases and others. At present, Mrs. Robinson is a president of the Association of European Election Officials, known as the ACEEO. Mrs. Robinson will be followed as an introducer by Mr. Sergei Danilenko. So Sergei Danilenko is currently the Chief of Staff of the Central Election Commission of the Russian Federation. He served as a member of the Central Election Commission of the Russian Federation with consultative vote in 2007 to 2011. Prior to that, from 1999 to 2003, he was a member of the Central Election Commission of the Russian Federation. With this, please allow me to pass the floor first to Mrs. Evelyn Robinson for the introductory speeches to be followed by Mr. Sergei Danilenko. Thank Mrs. You. Robinson, you have the floor. Thank you. Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, gathered by your sea in this honorable European Human Rights Conference, we all are united in our understanding that democratic institutions established under the terms of political pluralism, a multi-party system, and a guaranteed voting right to every elector are of a key importance to the development of democracies in our societies. Conducting democratic free and fair elections is a prerequisite for the overall democratic process. On the other hand, participating states should take all appropriate measures to ensure the right of citizens to political participation without undue restrictions, violence, intimidation, or fear of retribution. We all highlight the importance of enhancing the political, the political participation of women, youth, people with disabilities, and other disadvantaged groups to foster our democracies. This is why Developing legislation aimed at achieving these goals is a key task and a commitment for us, the participating states. It is taken over in the name of our citizens and for their prosperity. In many participating states of FOSI and in the Council of Europe, including Bulgaria, the election-related legislation underwent significant and positive transformations over the past decades. I'm going to give you some examples from my country. I can say that today Bulgaria, in Bulgaria, legal conditions and guarantees have been established for encouraging political pluralism, transparency, and accountability of political subjects, for exercise of voting rights of specific groups of the population, for the functioning of independent, permanent central election commission, which together with the election commissions at lower levels is operating in full transparency and for the functioning, uh, functioning of the Civil Council under the Central Election Commission venue of, uh, for experienced domestic observers. Its aim is to contribute for the transparency, democracy and fairness in elections in meaningful collaboration between governing bodies and civil society. These examples emphasize the key role of the OSC, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and the European Commission for Democracy through law, better known as the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe, for those positive legislative developments. The findings and conclusions, as well as the recommendations in the election observation reports and in their joint opinions on the amendments in the electoral legislation, have been made drivers for legislative changes and democratization of electoral process in my country. 
Another proof of the positive outputs resulting from the partnership between state institutions within international organizations is also the interaction between the election management bodies of the 25 states affiliated with the Association of the European Election Officials, ACEEEO, which I have the honor to preside this year. ACEEEO exists to promote sound democratic processes and procedures among its members and others involved in the electoral, electoral process. Therefore, the example of ACEEEO shows how an interaction, uh, international cooperation may provide knowledge and good examples for its member states. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have to defend the values that unite us and the commitments we have already undertaken and moreover, to fully ensure high quality when applying the existing regulations. The quality of the election process is facing not only traditional challenges, organizational accountability of campaign funding, etc. From now on, in the digital 21st century, we will face the conversion of social networks into mass communication channels with merry influence on election campaigns the hate speech and the online tools for its multiplication. The introduction of digital technologies in the voting and tabulation process and the associated risks and opportunities as part of the key challenges. It is of ever higher importance the effective interaction between organizations such as the OC in particular or the HR and the authorities of the participating states, the cross-sectoral interaction with civil society organizations, the use of social online platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, and more. It is not by accident that the annual international conference of the ACE, of ACEEEO to be held on 9th and 10th of November this year in Sofia, Bulgaria, is under the slogan, Conscious Voters in the Digital Age. Partnership, regulation, monitoring are the three pillars for interaction of international organizations, the state administration, civil society organizations, and the private communications businesses. There are at least three directions that could be subject to deliberations and further decisions. The first is how to ensure effective enforcement of the electoral law with regard to paid political advertising on social networks that parties, their candidates, and third party campaigners publish. In our country, for example, social networks are still outside the focus of the electoral law, hence of the electoral administration. Considering the delicate nature of such regulation, it must strike a balance between freedom of expression and law-regulated election campaign with level playing ground for all participants in the electoral race. The second important direction for future decisions is the restriction of hate speech used by parties and candidates in the election campaign and the role of the election administration in this regard. Here, the crucial importance of the unconditional distinction between freedom of expression and the principle of political pluralism on one hand and deliberate hatred and discrimination against particular ethnic groups, races, religions or political views on the other should be emphasized. The third important direction is remote electronic voting. These days we live online more than ever before. Obviously in the 21st century it is not enough to vote by the traditional means. Promoting citizens' political participation already requires the introduction of alternative electronic means of voting. Remote electronic voting can contribute to the desired greater involvement of citizens but also might face serious violations of the integrity of the electoral process. Prudent and comprehensive consideration and resolution of all problems and risks is necessary to guarantee citizens' rights, national security, transparency and fairness of the electoral process. Well, the prospect is clear enough. In the digital future, a good practice will be to vote digitally in both elections and referenda if we can ensure that. The truth is that as societies and institutions, we do not dispose of sufficient time to find solutions for these cha challenges. In the last few decades, our societies changed rapidly. Many countries were severely affected by crises and faced serious financial, economic, political and social problems.
In parallel to national crisis, we all are facing global threats such as climate change, security deteriorations, and others. Looking for workable political decisions in turbulent times such as today is becoming more and more difficult due to the growing public dissatisfaction with the political process and the reluctance of large part of society to take part in elections. This is why there is a clear and indisputable need to improve the democratic links between citizens and political institutions. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the way I had I see in closer cooperation between us, in strengthening the OC role, in particular that of Odia HR. I would like to emphasize that Bulgaria fully shares the position advocated by the European Union, whereas EU has repeatedly acknowledged the crucial role of ODHR in building up the public confidence in the governance processes and, uh, strength and thus strengthening democratic society and accountable institutions across the OC area, including through its electoral assistance and deployment of election observation missions. The EU has reiterated its strong support for ODHR's long-standing and well-established methodology, which is globally recognized. Today, I availed of the opportunity to express and reaffirm Bulgaria's support for the OC, in particular for the ODHR, as a key institution for the OC for its autonomy and financial security, for its significant contribution in the development of democratic institutions and civil society in the OC area. Strengthening the role of the OC or the HR in conjunction with the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe in the exante evaluation of proposed changes to the participating states' electoral legislation, deeper pre screening of OC or the HR election observers, enhanced dialogue and partnership with national authorities during election observation, and enhanced dialogue between the OC or the HR and the authorities of the participating states after the election and joint follow up meetings will optimally contribute towards accelerating the democratic processes in the participating states and tackling the challenges ahead. I believe that all the above, ladies and gentlemen, will strengthen the citizens' trust in democratic elections, democratic institutions, and democratic procedures for our common good. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Robinson. We appreciate uh, your contribution, and uh, it's an honor for us to have you here as an introducer for this session. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Sergei Danilenko. Господин Даниленко, Сергей Андреевич. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be able to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Colleagues, a free democratic election is key for a, the democracy of any, um, any country. It's seen as a fundamental principle of the constitutional structure of the country. And despite the fact that uh, Electoral law is in accordance with the electoral international standards, including all of the commitments within the OSCE. We are not um, going to focus on electoral development, and we use we don't stop there, and we use each electoral campaign to further develop uh, to democratic elections. Last Sunday, for example, there was the single-day election in Russia where two deputies for the State Duma were elected, 16, low, 16 regions uh, elected their representatives, and in six regions there were representatives sent to the state organs of the Russian Federation, and in 82 uh, regions, there were electoral, uh, there were local elections. 42 political parties participated, and uh, the rejection of candidates in the rare cases they arose was based on existing laws. Since the creation of our commission, the first representative, Ella Pamphilova, really focused on the importance of maximum transparency and trust from citizens to the or with the outcome of the elections. The role of ODEA uh, was to oversee the 2016 Russian elections, and they noted after that that under the 
new leadership of the Central Electoral Commission, uh, the conduct was high in trustworthiness. There was a high level of transparency, and that is something that has increased. We understand that it's necessary to keep on working uh, to improve legislation and electoral process. We've seen a lot of changes that have had a positive effect. In 2017, a law was adopted to ensure that the presidential elections and in the regional elections of the Russian Federation, uh, there there was a measure to do away with uh, early elections, which had led to an undermining of trust. And um, it's also in, it was important to ensure that voters voted where they lived. So we've seen a number of processes, which I think reflect what's happening not only in Russia, but in other, other countries, which broaden the, in, the possibility for voters to uh, participate. It's possible now to uh, register as a voter where you actually live. And the Electoral Commission has many different functions to play. It uh, does some of this through the website that it has, um, or linking up with the local municipalities' websites. Uh, internet provides us with the opportunity to do this kind of thing and uh, allows for the online participation in elections. All of all the voters have to do is turn up at the ballot box on the day of election. So we've improved registration. Uh, we've seen the registration of a much greater number of voters. Um, we're expecting millions more once the final figures come out. And at the same time, we're seeing the ease of including the voters on a single voters list. Um, We believe that these measures will certainly guarantee the active participation and therefore enhance trust. At the same time, uh, limitations uh, on observers in 2016 where uh, one candidate cannot name more than two observers and um, that is something that uh, we've applied certain limits to at the presidential election. The limitations we have applied won't uh, be implemented. So for the first time since 2011, the Central Electoral Commission is planning additional purchases of 50,000 uh, multi-level multi ballot papers, and this will allow us to better implement these technology, new technology, uh, the ballot boxes. Uh, the technology is well known and the package we're applying has received approval. And this will certainly benefit uh, from uh, wide dissemination and better trust. These systems will enable us to accelerate the processing of ballot papers and minimize the influence of uh, human error. Video surveillance of um, the uh, electoral process was used for the first time in 2012. On the 10th of September 2017, the system of video surveillance was used more than 60,700 times in, in various uh, constituencies. And it's something that's then been spread out uh, throughout the whole of the country. Uh, the rollout was used to fill in for the weak links in our system, and it certainly helped there. We're planning to extend this to um, city and cities and towns where more than 80% of voters in the Russian Federation are registered. For the presidential elections, we're using the QR framing technology. Uh, this is something that is planned and will enable us to better 
automize the delivery of the results. And this is uh, something which, this is a, a technology which is um, something that we're familiar with in our everyday life. And now we're going to use it, hopefully effectively, in our elections. What we are doing this way by using precise technology is ruling out the possibility of uh, errors, which will increase trust. The QR code program will better enable us to copy the uh, protocols which should be available at each voting station. And uh, like the previous um, speaker, a, a lot of what I'm saying is talking about how the inter internet is affecting our processes. Now, there has been criticism in the past about the observance process. I don't think that these such criticisms are uh, fully justified. We've always had enough observers from the party of the parties of the candidates. The total number of observers uh, this year was over 50,000 uh, individuals from uh, 22 parties, and uh, also. 20,000 people were named by the Central Electoral Committee to participate in the observance process. So the social process of uh, control, including the technologies available, such as video surveillance and the internet, make uh, the whole process completely transparent. So I hope everything is a reflection of the fact that we are not resting on our laurels. We're making the whole process as transparent as possible. We want to continue cooperating with our colleagues overseas and international organizations, including the OSCE ODEA, uh, so that we can strengthen real democratic values. First of all, free, competitive, and um, transparent elections. So I would like to thank uh, Ms. Gisla Dotter for her election to such, the, such an important post of, of uh, Director of, of ODIA. Uh, we hope very much that we can continue doing good work uh, to ensure effective observation of elections, avoiding double standards. Uh, seeing and we will overcome the artificial division between mature democracies and young democracies. I think we've left that behind us and have matured. I think ODEA needs to focus in a standard manner on all elections in all countries. Uh, it's not, it doesn't make sense to send five observers to one election, 500 to another. It's necessary to work with all countries of the OSCE uh, to achieve consensus on this. The Russian Federation in 2017 has made a number of proposals in this regard. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll be submitting this full statement for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergei Andreevich. We will open the floor to statements from uh, the delegations and the uh, civil society representatives. Right now, we have more than 40 speakers in the list already. With this in mind, I will set the uh, time limit at two and a half minutes, two minutes and 30 seconds. And I kindly ask you to observe this time limit so we can leave sufficient time for everybody to take the floor, as well as to exercise the potential right of reply in the end of the session. Uh, first speaker in my list is Poland on behalf of the European Union. Poland, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I am honored to present the statement on behalf of the EU and its member states. The full version of the statement will be circulated to all of you. The following countries align themselves with the statement which I am about to deliver. The former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Andorra. The EU is fully committed to fostering the values of democracy, rule of law, and respect for human rights worldwide. We believe that active participation of civil society, credible, inclusive, and transparent elections, 
pluralism, non-discrimination, safeguarding fundamental freedoms such as freedom of expression, freedom of the media, freedom of peaceful assembly and association, credible, inclusive and transparent elections, and effectiveness of the local and regional governments are all inseparable and vital for sustaining modern democratic societies. Mr. Moderator, our recommendations in relation to this, sessions, in relation to this session are the following. Participating states shall take all appropriate measures to increase participation of persons belonging to underrepresented groups in political life. In particular, women, youth, and persons belonging to marginalized groups, such as national, ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities, as well as persons with disabilities. We invite participating states to further enhance transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness of elections and encourage political pluralism. Participating states shall further engage in promoting genuine dialogue with civil society and enhance efforts to protect human rights defenders from any persecution or infringements of their human rights. We encourage the participating states to actively support freedom of the media, which constitute a prerequisite for credible, inclusive, and transparent democratic processes. We advocate for a closer cooperation with ODIR election observation missions through extending early and unrestricted invitations and through engaging on follow-up activities, especially by implementing ODIR recommendations and submitting voluntary reports to the OSC Human Dimension Committee. We call on participating states to make sure that ODIR has sufficient resources to conduct its activities as well as to continue seconding observers or contributing to the ODIR Observation Sustainability Fund. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is Rights and Freedoms of Turkmenistan Citizens, to be followed by Turkmenistan Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, moderator. Elections in Turkmenistan cannot be called uh, either free or democratic. There have been only three cases of elections and nobody knows. All elections happen along the same lines. The, uh, the electoral polls and teachers and doctors and security services control the entrance of voters to the voting polls. And if a member of a family is absent from uh, an election uh, for some reason, then it's their relatives are forced to vote for them during the presidential elections. So we're not talking about free elections here, on the contrary. Despite the fact that the international community did not recognize the latest elections, the president of our country continues to carry out his policy of instilling a monarchy in our country. And these policies have been brought back from the past, and he has taken the floor asking, with, uh, asking for the president to be given a lifelong term of office. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With this, I pass the floor to Turkmenistan Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. And the next speaker uh, on my list will be the International Humanist and Ethic uh, Union. Turkmenistan Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'd like to add a few words um, to those of uh, my colleague. As is known, in March's elections in 2017 uh, were observed by an ODIA uh, mission, and they came up with a conclusion that uh, the political conditions surrounding the elections were strongly controlled. There was a lack of authentic opposition or reasonable pluralism, and uh, these pose limiting factors on the electoral process. I think that this wording is understandable from the side of the OSCE, but I think it's a bit soft. As the previous speaker said, the elections were practically 
carried out under the conditions of a, a dictatorship of the current president. Unfortunately, the Turkmen delegation isn't present, but it's present. But it's very good that uh, what we're saying here is being streamed on the internet. So I'd like to put a few questions. Why is there no organized opposition in the country? Uh, why aren't there effective uh, trade unions? They only exist on paper. Elections in the country are subject to strong political control and failure to observe fundamental freedoms. Why don't voters have uh, the opportunity to choose between genuine political alternatives? At local elections, there are no independent observers, and the law hampers the putting forward of candidates. Uh, the Ministry of Justice has wide-ranging powers with regard to the registration process and uh, political assemblies. Why aren't these assemblies allowed, whether they be party or trade union? If um, the government is taking these decisions, how can, how can this be justified? Recently, the parliament amended the constitution, removing the limitation on uh, age, which uh, gives full power, as the previous speaker has said, uh, to the current president uh, to be given a life term and uh, the country will continue to exist in a non-democratic situation. Thank you. The International Humanist and Ethic Union to be followed by the Coalition for Democracy and Civil Society. International Humanist and Ethic Union, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Charter of Paris observes that democracy has at its foundation respect for the human person and the rule of law. Democracy is the best safeguard of freedom of expression, tolerance of all groups of society, and equality of opportunity for each person. Yet over recent years across the OSCE region, including in Moldova, Russia, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, and the USA, we have witnessed a marked increase in populist movements of differing degrees that, whilst brought about by democratic means originally, threatened to unpick these core foundations. Many of these populist movements at their base are rooted in demagoguery, where power is gained by the exploitation of prejudice, fear and ignorance, the whipping up of the passions and the shutting down of reason and deliberation. Their tendency toward post-fact, anti-expert, simplistic and intolerant standpoints serve to only nurture an anti-universalist tyr tyranny of the majority, which inevitably undermines the human rights of minorities, allows for extremism and threatens the very democratic system which gave, gave them a voice in the first place. Research has revealed a trend showing that populists in power undermine democracy in a number of specific ways, including the erosion of checks and balances on the executive branch, less media freedom, civil liberties being diminished, and the quality of elections declining. This has been borne out in Turkey, Russia, and Hungary since populist movements came to power. As the previous High Commissioner on National Minorities noted, extreme populism, both east and west of Vienna, plays on human insecurity. It rouses passions by saying that outsiders intrude on our values. It claims that aliens are stealing our jobs, abusing social security, and reducing opportunities. It appeals to nationalism and highlights the inaction of mainstream parties on the new issues. In order to, for democracy Excuse me. In order for democracy to stand robust and flourish, OSCE participating states need to better engage with the fear and frustration of so many of their citizens. They need to do more to acknowledge and respond to the voters' feeling of dejection, being failed by the state and mainstream parties, and better heed their concerns. Significantly, this needs to be done in a climate of open debate and education, evidence-based political action, and unwavering respect for human rights universally applied. If a democratic system loses sight of these foundations just to appease the population, populist agenda, that system will inevitably eventually crumble. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Coalition for Democracy and Civil Society to be followed by the United States of America. Coalition for Democracy and Civil Society, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, 
distinguished participants. As Amit Adilov and I am the head of the Coalition for Democracy and Civil Society. Our organization carries out independent election observation at all levels, and we've been doing so since 1999. In 2013, a reform began in the electoral system, and new technologies were introduced which restricted the possibilities for many uh, violations or rigging, a uh, case of rigging during elections. And this is designed indeed to improve the democracy democratic nature of elections in the Kyrgyz Republic. The, it was an amendment to the law on electoral procedure. And these amendments meant, however, that the observers were became civil society observers. And civil society observers, however, are now deprived of the right to challenge the actions of the Electoral Commission or the members who sit on that commission. And according to international standards that are universally recognized, independent civil society observation during elections is in such an include not just monitoring and detection of cases of violations, but also the possibility to contest the decisions of the Electoral Commission if it is deemed to be in breach of citizens' rights. Violations of electoral law, if they cannot be highlighted and the decisions challenged, then that makes no sense. We believe it is necessary to remove or repeal the law or it's pr the provision which limits the uh, right of citizens to in sign up to the electoral roll prior a few days before elections. And we also need to address inter-party and intra-party corruption. The parties continue to buy votes and many votes are prepared to uh, sell their votes in exchange for remuneration, that by no means helps consolidate a democratic government. So we urge the parties to stop these vote buying practices. And in particular, it is necessary to introduce an amendment to our national legislation to foresee, in such ways would foresee measures for prohibiting vote buying. There also needs to be measures to address party programs and, uh, in particular, concerns local elections and local representation and programs for developing cities and rural areas. And it is important to help citizens better assess the work of their local and national governments. Finally, I would like to thank ODEA for sending a large group of international observers to our country. I would like to express the hope that the forthcoming presidential elections will go ahead without any violations and that they will be free and democratic. I also hope that ODIA and the government of Kyrgyzstan, in the framework of their cooperation, will carry out joint work aimed at holding fair and democratic elections. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. On my list is the United States of America to be followed by the Russian Public Institute of Electoral Law. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, moderator. OSC election commitments were first adopted in 1990. Flawed elections cannot now be attributable to lack of experience, but rather to attempts to stay in power. This is the case in Belarus, Russia, and Azerbaijan, as well as Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. We were pleased the OSCE could conduct a full observation mission during Uzbekistan's 2016 presidential elections, the country's first, and welcome the OSCE's ability to observe Turkmenistan's 2017 elections. We urge follow-up on the recommendations. We also hope the Kyrgyz Republic ensures that its coming up uh, elections meet OSCE norms. We urge Bosnia and Herzegovina to rid its electoral framework of ethnic criteria that are discriminatory and outdated, ignoring the, excuse my language, Sedish uh, Finci ruling is not a uh, solution. We refuse to recognize the illegitimate referenda, such as those organized in the Republika Srpska entity of Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the Russian-occupied region of South Ossetia in Georgia. 
We continue to reject as illegitimate the sham Crimean referendum perpetrated by Russia in 2014. Crimea remains a part of Ukraine, and no amount of Russian claims to the contrary will change that reality. Referendum may be used to undermine constitutional checks and erode protections of members of minorities. Such are uh, the concerns regarding referenda in Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. We commend ODIR for observing the Turkish referendum. We thank the OSCE for observing the general elections in the United States last year. The issues addressed in the election observation mission report are the focus of intent public debate, court proceedings, and efforts to advance legislative improvements in our country. While federal, state, and local officials may not agree with all of the AOM's conclusions and recommendations, we do consider them seriously. We invite foreign observation and will continue to do all we can at the federal level to facilitate it. Access of foreign observers remains subject to state and local laws and regulations. We will work to foster domestic understanding of observation missions and improve access. Unhelpfully, Russia declined to observe our elections as part of the OSCE effort and instead mounted a propaganda stunt. We also cannot ignore Russia's deliberate interference in the elections of other countries. The National Director, or Director of National Intelligence in the United States detailed the intelligence community's assessment regarding Russian efforts to influence our 2016 presidential elections. We also witnessed significant Russian interference in Montenegro's parliamentary elections last October, including a coup plot. Russia falsely claims that other countries do the same. The U.S., OSCE, and like-minded efforts to support democracy and human rights are designed to strengthen and support, not to subvert democratic processes, and to empower the citizen. These efforts are conducted openly, help foster elections that are genuinely competitive, and do not back particular outcomes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Russian Public Institute of Electoral Law, to be followed by Human Rights Vision. Russian Public Institute of Electoral Law, you have the floor. Uh, Thank you very much indeed, uh, moderator and uh, participants. We'd uh, like to welcome the OSCE's efforts to promote democracy and uh, welcome the mission of ODIA. Uh, we'd like to see their involvement in, um, as observers in next year's elections. The discreditation of the electoral process uh, in the U.S., uh, the issues there, and the issues related to last year's elections have had a negative result, undermining public trust in the democratic process. Uh, the ODIA mission has adopted a passive position with regard to last year's presidential elections in the U.S. I'd like to see the OSCE play a more active role. Uh, it is important to identify discrimination and other issues. What we uh, are looking for look, is a ways of promoting democratic institutions. We've seen that the EU has been slow on this point as well. The um, ODIA's previous director uh, has not spoken on this. The What we have at the moment are fake international observers in Armenia, uh, Georgia, etc. We see articles being published which are misleading. And uh, the, the importance of this cannot be understated. From 2012 onwards, we have looked at OC documents uh, for which have uh, related to the missions of ODIA in Russia, but we haven't had the opportunity to get specific data on these missions. Uh, there are, have been 7,000 uh, such in investigations, but we haven't had the data from these relating to the emission. So it's important to have the open, transparent data uh, from these missions by the ODIA in Russia. We believe that the OSC, which is responsible for monitoring, needs to follow a 
standard approach to elections and referenda, applying the same standards wherever it applies, including uh, uh, the Catalonia referendum coming up. It is important to participate actively uh, when we're talking about representatives of international organizations, and we need a standardized approach uh, to elections, we cannot have accusations of bias. And I'd invite everybody to our round table, which is taking place at the end of this session. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Human Rights Vision, to be followed by the Independent Association of uh, Independent Democrats Against Authoritarian Regimes. Human Rights Vision, you have the floor. Thank you, dear moderator. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. As it's known, democratic states cannot exist without democratic institutions and the civil society. Even though Tajikistan constitutionally has a multi-party system of government, in reality, it is a one-party state where the power rests in hands of one ruling political party. Other parties are formally recognized in an attempt to show to the whole world that Tajikistan is a legitimate democratic country. The legal profession and non-governmental human rights groups are institutions of civil society. Three years ago in Tajikistan, 3,800 non-governmental public organizations were registered, while in 2017 that number is around 1,000. One year ago in Tajikistan, there were five active bar associations and 2,000 lowers. Now there is only one active bar association lowers with barely around 300 lawyers. All of this was connected to a number of unconstitutional laws that were adopted during last two years, according to which lawyers now are under the supervision of the Ministry of Justice. Absent a civil society, there are no free elections. Having only one leader for 26 years has a significant impact. Elections take place under duress and results are often determined by local governments in advance. Even the list of deputies is formed by authorities. Those not on the list of acceptable candidates who run for office end up on a blacklist likely to face future problems. Election campaign consists of state employees such as teachers, doctors and social workers. All school and preschool institutions are presented as sites for holding elections. State authorities have a list of nominees for 25 years, according to which the same individuals are elected to to in turn to parliament or as ministers. In such a situation, any semblance of free election disappears. In 2005, two lawyers, Faiznisov Vahidova and Nizamidin Bigmatov, nominated themselves for parliamentary elections. After the elections, both were arrested on preposterous charges. Citizens have absolutely no right to choose their political representatives and no right of being elected. On behalf of Human Rights Vision Foundation, we appeal to Tajikistan authorities to overturn the laws that contradict to democratic principles, to provide to representatives of civil society unimpeded access to propose open candidacy for election of all levels, to provide access to international organizations to independent monitoring of holding elections in order to provide to international community the impartial assessment of their legitimacy. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Independent Association of Independent Democrats Against Authoritarian Regimes, to be followed by Canada. Independent Association of Independent Democrats Against Authoritarian Regimes, you have the floor. Thanks. Distinguished participants, Mr. Moderator, the dictator states, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and aggressive Russia. In 2016, we said that the dictatorship in Turkmenistan would soon deprive water and electricity, uh, deprive all its citizens of water and electricity. The president of Turkmenistan is uh, holding all the powers in his hands. And the new president of Kazakhstan has shown that he plans new democratic measures at the regional level. In Azerbaijan, there is no kind of democracy. There is only a dictatorship and repression is ongoing. There are already 160 political prisoners in the country. 
the organization OCCRP has shown that Azerbaijan has bought European politicians for billions of dollars. They have bought the support of European politicians. It is clear that Azerbaijan is basically expanding repression. In Russia, there is no democracy. In Tajikistan, it has been found that the family of Rahman has taken on all the trappings of a dictatorship and that there is no light at the end of the tunnel yet. Lukashenko in Belarus has installed a totalitarian system and there is an electronic database of all those who do not work and there are thousands of those and this database will be extended to all citizens and then there will also be electronic bracelets that people will be forced to wear. In Poland there was a fine tax imposed on other on citizens working in other EU countries. At the time, the dictator in Belarus, Mr. Lukashenko, had a big opportunity to show the West that there could be democracy as long as the Russian aggression against Belarus did not get in the way. We urge Western politicians to convince the dictators that there can be democratic institutions and to try and disseminate within these countries general knowledge about human rights. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is Canada to be followed by the Latvian Human Rights Committee. Canada, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Today in parts of the OSCE area, democratic institutions are under threat on several fronts in a way not seen since the end of the Cold War. Restrictions on voting rights use of law enforcement and the military for voter intimidation, control of the media, and attacks on the independence of the judiciary are examples of the threats that are undermining the democratic functioning of our societies. This also includes a ramping up of propaganda powered by digital means and social media, enabling those who seek to undermine democratic institutions to do so with greater anonymity and potential impact than ever before. In the face of these multiple and evolving threats, we must retain focus on important international objectives and commitments that will support these institutions in the long run. Canada believes that in order to support and strengthen democracy, we must continue to uphold the values of peaceful pluralism, inclusive and accountable governance, and respect for diversity and human rights, including the empowerment of women and girls. Canada is seeking to support these aims through its international policy agenda. Indeed, our new feminist international assistance policy ensures that gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls are at the center of our efforts to support the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. Women and girls are powerful enablers of democracy and democratic institutions, and as such, Canada is using its development policy to encourage their greater political participation, leadership, and decision-making in developing countries. Madam, uh, Mr. Moderator, Civic space is crucial to protecting our democratic institutions because it is civil society that advocates and urges governments to be more transparent and accountable. Unfortunately, those who seek to weaken democracy have targeted civil society actors and human rights defenders, often as a precursor to attacking and undermining human rights and government institutions later. It is incumbent upon us all to unite against such behavior and support civil society at home and internationally. For us, at home, we are committed to improving, strengthening, and protecting our country's democratic institutions, and our Minister of Democratic Institution has a specific mandate to ensure that Canadians trust and participate in our democratic processes. As Chair of the Community of Democracies Working Group on Enabling and Protecting Civil Society, we are also working with other government and civil society members to employ quiet diplomacy towards securing better legislative outcomes for civil society where governments are attempting to unduly restrict their efforts. In conclusion, Mr. Moderator, we continue to believe that it is critical that OSCE participating states respect their commitments to democratic principles 
and pursue policies and programs that support civic space and democratic institutions domestically and internationally. In this regard, we would like to put forward the following two recommendations. Firstly, that the OSCE and ODIR continue to seek additional opportunities to support civic space and democratic institutions. And secondly, that support for civic space and democratic institutions by the OSCE and ODIR take into account new technological threats and seek out means to address these. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Latvian Human Rights Committee to be followed by the Vina Akademika Bund. Thank Latvian you. Latvian Human Rights Committee, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, in this June, the local elections took uh, place in Latvia for the seventh time, seventh time in a row. It was an election without participation of a large part of the population. Why so? First of all, because of more than 230,000 people uh, without any citizenship. Stateless person, most of them with a particular status of so-called non-citizens. They are more than 11% of the population at all, and among voting age population, even more than 13%. Mostly it is a problem connected with ethnic minorities in particular but uh, stateless people are not the only ones here with uh, the problem of access to elections. Also among foreigners, uh, Latvia allows only citizens of EU member states to take part in local elections, although most of the foreign citizens living in Latvia are citizens of other OSCE participating states, not members of the European Union. OSCE recommended for several times to allow so-called non-citizens to vote in local elections, but uh, so far it has not been implemented and uh, we recommend to follow the recommendations of ODHR and High Commissioner on National Minorities. Besides, the same local elections have been the sixth time in a row without participation of the former members of the Communist Party, which was forbidden without trial in 1991, although 11 years ago, in 2006, both the European Court of Human Rights and the Constitutional Court of Latvia himself, itself have said that uh, this restriction must be lifted soon. Finally, uh, before these elections, for the first time, one of local councillors was deprived of his seat in December 2016 for allegedly insufficient command of Latvian language. The voters were satisfied with that councillor. They had elected him three times in a row. Moreover, this June, he was elected for the fourth time in a row in Balvi municipality, and now uh, the official authorities ask him to underwent Latvian language check once again. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is uh, Wiener Akademika Bund, to be followed by the uh, for fair elections. Vina Akademika Bund, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Henrik Clausen, representing Wiener Akademika Bund in Austria. The annotated agenda for this session rightly encourages democracy to be the only system of government for our nations, and we can wholeheartedly agree with this. Democracy means rule of the people, no more, no less. This also means that national sovereignty is the ultimate expression of democracy and that the people of a nation ultimately has the sovereign right to rule the country for better or for worse. Without a demos, there can be no true democracy. We face a crisis of confidence now with multiple challenges to democracy and the sovereignty of the people. One challenge is the overseas interpretation of international conventions, and another is the mass immigra immigration into our countries. An important point here is that many migrants lack respect for the law of the land that they migrate to, and for the demo democratic process as such. Specifically, Islamic doctrine rejects the legitimacy of man-made law, claiming that Islamic law, Sharia, is the only permissible legal system for all of mankind. This is fundamentally incompatible with democracy and human rights. These inalienable rights are intrinsic to human nature. Governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, deriving their just rights from the consent of the, of the government. 
This is the basis for trust in and legitimacy of democratic institutions. When governments fail to secure the rights of the citizens, trust and legitimacy nat naturally diminishes. In order to uh, restore trust in politicians and public office holders, governments need to focus more on protecting the freedoms of citizens than to regulate them. This means abolishing restrictions like blasphemy laws, hate speech laws, and other limits to freedom of expression. Also urgently needed is a response to Islamists who openly discourage Muslims from participating in democracy, or otherwise denigrate democracy and promote Sharia. This challenge needs to be met based on the rule of law and the documented incompatibility of Sharia and democracy. Therefore, we recommend that blasphemy laws and other meaningless regulations be abolished, that governments and relevant authorities counter the threat from Sharia, and that the sovereignty of the people over international conventions be reasserted. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is for fair elections to be followed by the Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights. For fair elections, you have the floor. Good day. Good afternoon. And participant civil society uh, sees that um, the work of the OSCE could certainly be more valuable. It needs to adopt uh, uh, leadership amongst organizations um, in uh, observing uh, elections. However, the work of the ODEA despite repeated attempts to improve it, is still raising questions amongst experts. For example, despite the principle of equality of states, after more than 20 years, the work of the ODEA um, does, it does not equally apply uh, electoral missions, applying different standards to different states. Uh, six um, countries have uh, had all of their elections observed. So there's a clear imbalance here in terms of the priorities of the OSCE and its emissions. Almost half of them uh, included the same 10 specialists, more than two thirds uh, uh, addressed only a small amount of the OSCE countries and uh, very few um, were given a, a balanced representat representation. All countries who have had uh, officers, have had the director in the office of the, of the ODEA actually receive very few emissions. So we can see that this imbalance applies across the board. The ODEA is still not um, responding to the recommendations that it's re or the proposals it's receiving from states. The office uh, does not uh, submit uh, transparent information either to state organs. So uh, there could be a huge contribution made by the ODEA, but there are clearly problems. More detailed analysis of the activities of the ODEA will be given at the round table after this meeting in room number one at 6.15. Thank you very much. On my list is the Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights to be followed by the Union of Informed Citizens. Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ahmad Shaidov. I represent Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Ordery for organizing such kind of meeting today uh, because we are uh, discussing a very relevant topic. Uh, democracy is the most perfect way of life in which humanity is to live. People choose uh, this lifestyle voluntarily and live in peace and prosperity. That's first of all, uh, society should love democracy. Today, representatives of 57 countries here, uh, each of us has different history, culture, values, and lifestyle. But we all have a goal, a democratic society and human rights. We are united in, in an organization called OEC and regularly conducting discussions here. Each of us has its own ideas and attitudes about democracy. As a short comment to statement of U.S. representatives here, I can say that if there is intolerance, discrimination, and murders on the race ground in the United States, 
today, which is known as homeland of democracy all over the world. If President Donald Trump calls the prestigious CNN channel as fake news, so it means the basis of democracy in the world is collapsing. I want to briefly describe the democratic environment and election in South Caucasus. First of all, I would like to give a brief overview on the current situation in Armenia. It's difficult uh, to imagine the existence of an independent Armenia today because this is actually Russia's four post. The current Sarkisian regime has dictatorial regime in the country as, and uh, has completely eliminated uh, its rivals. Moreover, the Armenian government, which used the Nagorno-Karabakh issue to continue domestic repression, remains a threat to, uh, to the South Caucasus region. After the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the only free and democratic society in the region was established in Georgia and respectively in Azerbaijan. Georgia is able to succeed in this area and is one step ahead. Today, Georgia, despite all the difficulties, is a country where democracy and human rights are most guaranteed in the South Caucasus. Elections held in Georgia have received a, a positive opinion of local and international uh, observation missions. Secondly, I would like to name Azerbaijan. After independence, Azerbaijan has uh, undergone a serious development uh, in the field of democracy. Azerbaijan, which was in a state of war and lost 20% of its territory, gained considerable successes in its integration with the West. The citizens have the right to elect and be elected since uh, 1993 elections. I was a candidate to the Member of Parliament during the elections in 1915 in Azerbaijan, and from my own experience, I can say that today we have democracy in Azerbaijan, but it's not at the perfect level, sure. There are certain difficulties, and this is normal, because Azerbaijan, which has been a part of the Soviet Union for 70 years, uh, is an independent country for the last 26 years. However, events in the U.S., which has a 250-year history of independence, did not happen in Azerbaijan. At the end of my speech, uh, uh, I, I want to conclude my uh, opinion. So there are maybe some uh, minor irregularities in the election in Azerbaijan. This is normal and uh, inevitable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Union of Informed Citizens, to be followed by Uzbekistan. Union of Informed Citizens, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. First, I would like to call Honorable Re uh, Representative of Armenia not to manipulate my words because I've never talked about rights of armed rebels. Uh, I was talking about rights of peaceful and only peaceful demonstrators coming back to elections. In April this year, parliamentary elections were held in Armenia. The alliance of NGOs formed by us and our partners observed these elections with 500 long-term and short-term observers. Observation mission revelated the following. Authorities have widely abused the administrative resource. Influence was acted on waters by employees of schools, kindergartens, official bodies, and uh, businesses belonging to oligarchs. And we succeeded in finding facts to prove that. By the way, ruling party was so dissatisfied with our findings that we became persecuted instead of those who used public resources for interests of one particular party. Second, ca cases of distribution of election bribes were also widespread. Uh, however, in all cases, when citizens provided uh, journalists with detailed information about election bribes given or offered to them, all of them suddenly denied it after visiting the police stations. Third, for many years, propaganda has convicted, uh, convinced our citizens in every possible way that the ruling party has no alternative and nothing can be changed with elections. As a result, a considerable part of uh, Armenians came to the conclusion that the citizens only benefit from election could be an election bribe of 20 euros from ruling party. Fourth, the authorities did not take measures to raise public awareness about the new electoral system. The propaganda turned the election into competition of district candidates who were mostly semi-criminals or oligarchs representing one single party, ruling party. Fifth, during the election day, in 66% of polling station cases of voting control in voting booths uh, were, were recorded, 66% of polling stations. Mostly, most of problems were uh, was mentioned in OSCO dear election observation mission report as well. 
uh, you can find our report on the table near the entrance. But uh, dear colleagues and honorable representative of Armenia, of course, Armenian elections were better than, for example, in Azerbaijan. But uh, if no observers were beaten and no ballot stuffing took place during the election, it doesn't mean that the elections were democratic. In North Korea as well, observers are not beaten and ballot stuffing does not occur. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is Uzbekistan to be followed by Kyrgyzstan. Uzbekistan, you have the floor. Was a moderator, ladies and gentlemen. The important part of improving electoral uh, legislation is something that we've been working on. On the 7th of February this year, we published the Strategy of Action, which contained five pillars for 2017 to 2021 uh, to implement this strategy. And in light of recommendations from international organizations, including ODEA, uh, following uh, observation of the 2016 elections, uh, we have adopted a comprehensive plan of action uh, for implementing the plan in practice, which is a kind of roadmap. And this is something which uh, is going to eliminate um, the conflicting procedures, unifying standards and uh, standardized procedures for election of parliamentarians and the president. At the moment, we are developing a project for the electoral code for Uzbekistan. Uh, this will enable us to use ballot paper as the legitimate document for elections, uh, implementing observation involving uh, NGOs, and uh, citizens' organizations implement recommendations uh, for putting forward candidates uh, and electing members of the Central Electoral Commission, the implementation of new technological uh, processes, and also establishing a uh, individual uh, single list of voters. Uh, which will have uh, voters that will enable us to avoid double voting um, and uh, voting on behalf of others, as well as re respecting the fundamental principle of one voter, one vote. I'll be submitting the full text of my uh, statement for the record and uh, would like to um, welcome the. Uh, cooperation we've had with the office. We have uh, had a large number of exchanges, especially in implementing the projects which I've talked about. We are now in phase two of implementing the project, and that is something that is benefiting from the participation of the uh, international organizations. We've um, taken on a lot of uh, specific practices relating to the conducting of elections. And these um, are the areas where we're working with ODEA. The uh, dialogue we've had has been very constructive, and this is um, something that has been reflected the first half of this year, where a delegation uh, headed by Mr. Link came uh, we also had uh, other specialists in the delegation which um, provided us with cooperation based on cooperation. We've also enjoyed the uh, expert input from the Viennese Commission and uh, carrying out a review of our legislation uh, with expert input from these organizations. And we will uh, continue to strengthen our cooperation of this kind. Thank you for your attention. The next speaker on my list is uh, Kyrgyzstan, to be followed by Kazakhstan. Kyrgyzstan, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, for giving me the floor. 
since 2010, Kyrgyzstan is a country with a parliamentary democracy, and over the last seven years, there have been a number of achievements made, inclu including we have increased the level of openness and transparency of decision-making procedures and participation in political parties, both in terms of the executive and judiciary and in terms of state governance in general. There are more opportunities for various factions to take part in decision-making processes and in the parliamentary activities. And we have also expanded the uh, cooperation between the uh, party in government and the opposition, and this has reduced tensions and uh, fostered more harmonized decisions. We have also reshuffled the composition of the ruling party and the opposition, and this has again fostered greater stability in our country. In December last year, there was a referendum on amendments to the constitution which were designed to strengthen parliamentary democracy, and the constitutional reform has also helped undo the authoritarian system that was in place beforehand and enhance parliamentary government. The state head of state's powers have been reduced, and he plays a most representative role now. Ensuring the rule of law is essential for democracy, and government institutions have a key role to play here. The principle of behind this is being successfully put into practice in practice and thanks to the reforms which I mentioned. There are other examples which I can um, refer to, but I mentioned them during the previous session. For instance, we have uh, cooperation with internet publications, and then there are arrests which have been linked to the uh, major disorders that took place in 2010 in the south of the country. and. All of this has been done on the basis of national legislation and involving multiple participants in fair trials. Elections are a key part of democratic processes, and in our country we have now established all the necessary conditions for the people to freely express their will and to make sure that the electoral process is transparent. The parliamentary elections since 2010 have been held with cutting-edge technologies which helps prevent vote rigging and other violations of the electoral process. And this inc and also now only citizens who are biometrically registered can register to vote. We also make sure that gender equality is respected as well as the rights of ethnic minorities. Amongst the political parties, there are multiple ones which have received support, including uh, from uh, civil society and the new cutting edge technologies we've implemented have benefited from support from all parties. We, there is the observation mission of ODIA that will go to uh, Kyrgyzstan, and in total, we expect there to be more than 400 uh, observers. The Kyrgyz Republic is glad to note the constructive and fruitful cooperation that has taken place with the OEC on developing democratic elections and democratic institutions. We are prepared to cooperate with international organizations, primarily with uh, ODIA, in order to monitor elections to enhance their transparency and openness. Thank you for your attention, and the full text will be distributed. The next speaker on my list is Kazakhstan, to be followed by Promolex Association. Kazakhstan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, my name is Sarsimbaev Murat. I am a member of the Central Election Commission of the Republic of Kazakhstan. We closely work together with Alexander Schlick, Richard Lapin, Radevoy Gruich, uh, with issues concerning the international observers of the elections in Kazakhstan. In a whole, we are grateful to OSC, OSC ODIR, for the observatory work for our elections. Nine recommendations out of 24 of the final report of the mission of OSC ODIR are implementing in Kazakhstan. But meanwhile, 
we should underline that uh, in, in the final report of uh, 2016, the revealed shortcomings are written down without indication of the numbers of the polling stations where they have occurred. We ask the supervisors of the OEC, OEC ODIR, to pay attention to this aspect of the observer's work. Because in the code of the OEC ODIR observers, it is said that uh, it is pointed that it is desirable, it is expedient to indicate the origin of the shortcomings. On uh, 28 June, 2017 election to the Senate of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan was held. I would like to note that the peculiarity of the analyzed election campaign was the introduction and functioning of a pilot project of the electronic registration of the electors on the day of election and on informing the results of voting in each region immediately after the election is over in the online regime. In this connection, even a hint of falsification of the vote count was excluded. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is the Promolex Association to be followed by the Council of Europe. Promolex Association, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nikolai Panfil from Promolex Association, Republic of Moldova. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share with distinguished participants the most recent, but also most concerning aspects of the electoral developments in my country. I will speak here on behalf of my organization, but also of a group of other seven civil society organizations that undersign the current statement, namely the Institute for Development and Social Initiatives, the Legal Resource Center from Moldova, Association of Independent Press, European Institute of Politics and Reforms, Transparency International Moldova, Association for Participatory Democracy, and the East Europe Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, on July 20, current year, the Moldovan Parliament has adopted the law number 154 on the switch from the proportional electoral system to a mixed system for the electing the MPs. The signatory organizations recognize the right of the Moldovan Parliament to amend the electoral system. However, the organizations underline that such a dramatic amendment of the electoral system should be done in strong correlation with the national standards established in the Constitution of the Republic of Moldova, as well as in the international commitments and recommendations of the UN Council of Europe, Venice Commission, OCU ODIR. The signatory organizations draw the attention that the electoral system was amended without taking into account the main recommendation of the Venice Commission, which pointed out that the switch from the proportional to mixed voting system is not advisable for the Republic of Moldova. In addition, the organizations want to pay your attention to a series of important deficiencies in the said law, such as, number one, the election of the MPs through a single round election, as it is provided in the adopted law, will ensure a lower representativeness of the parliament compared to the election of the president and of the mayors, which take place in two rounds. Under such circumstances, the signatory organizations consider that the parliament has infringed the Article 60 of the Constitution that established the, the parliament as a supreme representative body. Secondly, the organizations are very much concerned with the violation of the principle of equality of votes provided in the recently adopted law. This observation is based on the fact that the minimum threshold to enter the parliament on the basis of the list of candidates submitted by the political parties in the nationwide constituency will be higher than that to be recorded in, single, uh, in certain single member constituencies. For example, at a minimum electoral score of 6% and a participation rate of 50% of voters, a political party will be able to delegate only three members to the parliament from the nationwide list of candidates, which equals about 28,000 votes per mandate. In the same time, in the single member constituencies, at the same participation rate, an MP would be elected with only about three to 5,000 votes. A special concern also resides in the fact that the principle of equality of votes wouldn't be possible to be enforced in the constituencies created on the territory of Gagauz Autonomy, Transnistrian region, as well as for the voters residing abroad. 
Number three, in the light of the above mentioned deficiency, the sanitary organization regret that the Moldovan parliament ignored the recommendation of the Venice Commission on the lowering of the electoral threshold from the 6% barrier. Number four, the organizations are extremely concerned with the fact that the adopted law excludes from the electoral process about 5% of the voter, voters, which equals about 158,000 voters who have neither domicile nor residence. Number five, and the last one. The last significant deficiency I want to bring to your attention refers to the ignorance of the Venice Commission recommendation which called the Parliament to establish an independent commission for drawing the boundaries of the single mandate constituencies. On the contrary, the Parliament empowered the government, which is a political body subordinated to the parliamentary majority, to set up the commission for the establishment of the single member constituencies. Unfortunately, the Parliament also failed to include the boundaries of the single member constituencies in the electoral code as it was recommended by many civil society organizations. In conclusion, given the infringement of the above mentioned principles and standards, the sanitary organizations address the Moldovan authorities to withdraw the law on the amendment of the electoral system and return to a proportional electoral system. Also, Chair, if you allow me, I would like to share with you two recommendations we want to make to the representatives of the participating uh, states and other international stakeholders. Uh, First, I'm afraid we have to observe the time limit. Just two propositions. We are quite a bit over the time to limit. To concede now. and support any legal request initiated within the country for the abolition of the mixed voting system and the return to proportional voting system. And second, to monitor the implementation of the recommendation of the Venice Commission and OCU ADIR produced in connection with the recently held elections and the amended electoral system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would encourage uh, all the speakers to observe the time limits. We're already allowing to go uh, beyond the preset time limits. Uh, the next speaker on my list is the Council of Europe to be followed by Ukraine. Uh, I would like to, before I pass the floor to the next speaker, I would like to also encourage to address the first part of the uh, annotated agenda uh, in your remarks, specifically the democracy at the national, regional, and local levels the importance of pluralism, the political parties, as well as the functionings of parliaments. It is, of course, of uh, great honor for us, and as the uh, leadership of the election department, to hear so much on elections, but there is a, another part of the annotated agenda that we would like you um, that we would like to encourage you to address as well in your statements. With this, I pass the floor to the Council of Europe, and the next speaker on my list will be uh, Ukraine. Council of Europe, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Moderator, responsive, transparent, and accountable institutions are the bedrock for, uh, of democracy. Council of Europe member states are committed to the fundamental principles of political democracy, individual freedom, political liberty, and the rule of law, and engage in a dialogue and action in favor of the maintenance and further realization of these ideals, and in the interest of economic and social progress. In the field of democracy and governance, the Intergovernmental Committee on Democracy and Governance acts as a forum where member states can exchange information and good practice and engage in constructive partnerships through peer reviews, direct assistance, and the development of new standards. One of the major fields of action continues to be the design of proper implementation of legislation and policy for central, local, and regional government reforms, including in respect to territorial administrative reforms, competencies and resources of local authorities, governance of metropolitan areas, and transfrontier cooperation. The Council of Europe Center of Expertise for Local Government Reform develops and implements programs aimed at supporting legal reforms and the strengthening of capacities of local, regional, and central authorities throughout Europe. Moreover, the Council of Europe continues to encourage the implementation of the strategy for innovation and good governance at local level. It is based on assessments of how local authorities conduct their affairs with regard to the 12 principles of good democratic governments, on the identification of possible changes to be made and the measures to be adopted, and on the establishment of partnerships between central authorities and local authorities to promote good governance at every level. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is Ukraine, to be followed by the political movement Group 24. Ukraine, you have the floor. Uh, dear Mr. Moderator, dear colleagues, uh, Ukraine aligns itself with the statement of European Union, but I would like to add some points in my national capacity. Next March, there will be presidential elections in Russian Federation. I am sure Russian government, following international commitments, will invite international observers. So, ODIR and several other organizations will conduct observation. I suspect uh, that Russian Federation will organize some activities looking like elections on the territory of temporarily occupied Crimea. Unlegal annexation of Crimea was stated in United Nations General Assembly resolution adopted on the 27th of March in 2014. This resolution says, calls upon all states, international organizations, and specialized agencies not to recognize any alteration of the status of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol on the basis of the above-mentioned referendum and to refrain from any action or dealing that might be interpreted as recognizing any such alterated status. OSCE Parliamentary Assembly two months ago adopted Minsk Declaration where clearly says OSCEPA calls on the Russian Federation to restrain its aggressive practices and reverse its annexation of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. I thank United States Representative uh, for mentioning Crimea occupation in uh, your speech. Last general elections, Russian authorities also opened polling stations in Crimea. Odir did not send observers there, and we appreciate it. On behalf of Ukrainian delegation in OSCE EPA, I ask ODIR and other election observation missions and organizations to refrain from any observation activity in illegally annexed Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. We also ask to mention very clear in observation reports and any analytical reports that observation in Crimea were not conducted following international commitments and resolutions. I would like also to inform all the participants that uh, politicians elected on so-called elections in Crimea are not allowed to participate in any official international events, and I hope we will continue such practice. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Political Movement Group 24, to be followed by Armenia. Political Movement Group 24, you have the floor. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy to Head of Political Moment and Official Representative in the Kingdom of Sweden, Hussein Ashuruf. Democracy is not all about a form of government. As President John F. Kennedy once said, democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Democracy means that you not only have the rights to be heard, but being listened to. There is democracy when you are given the right to choose or decide on decision that directly affects us. To go further in its meaning, it is a way of thinking, a responsibility. Without democracy, society feels pain. On the other hand, we are countries have dictatorship. There is no freedom of thought or creativity. A country cannot succeed if others' ideas are not appreciated. With only one idea, Adhere to the country will be dead. This is well reflected by Rahmanov's regime in the country, which remains the poorest country in ex-Soviet Union. Based on dependable stati statistical data, democracy has been cracked down for the last years. The country has become a one-party state with Rahmanov, with Imam Ali Rahmanov as president. Being a one-party state, the government of Tajikistan for the last 24 years has violated several human rights, and today he has buried democracy, whilst the people today need it like oxygen. These rights not only about extrajudicial killing, but extremely. It has forced our people, culture, and religion beliefs to change. In this light, we suggest to all concerned authority to give serious attention. As we call for honest and clear election, elections are a central eye, central eye of democracy. For elections 
to express the will of the electorate, they must be free and fair. Therefore, we need a change, a change of regime and transformation from dictatorial to democracy. We need good, we need good governance. We need freedom. We need self-respect. We need all fundamental rights equally as citizens of Tajikistan. Therefore, we will continue to struggle for the good cause in our capacity and would take any action that is required to bring down Imam Ali's regime and restore democratic system of governance, governance which is responsible for the people. We will continue our resistance by non-violent means to achieve justice with the full support of international community. Finally, a request from the international community and democratic countries to give serious attention for the issue and facilitate stage for the civil human rights protectors and freedom fighters, those who want to establish a real democratic country and survive democratic idea in the mind of people in future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is uh, Armenia, to be followed by the Helsinki Citizens Assembly Vanazor. Armenia, you. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Armenia attaches great importance to free and fair realization of the right to vote and form the government elsewhere in the OEC area, regardless of the status of territories, in line with Universal Declaration of Human Rights, ICCPR, and OEC commitments. At previous HD, my delegation was privileged to refer to the elaboration of electoral code, and today I am pleased uh, electoral code of Armenia, and today I am pleased to present the outcomes of its implementation in April 6 parliamentary elections. New electoral code, which was an outcome of inclusive political process and agreement among the ruling and opposition parties represented in the parliament. The civil society was also represented in the entire consultation process. The agreement fully addressed a significant part of the joint recommendations of the Venice Commission and ODIR, something that was acknowledged in the preliminary findings and conclusions of the International Observation Mission. This agreement was essential in two major ports, points. First, it addressed all outstanding and divisive issues of previous elections, including identification of voters, and post-election publication of the signed voter list. This agreement has been strictly observed at these elections. Second, the agreement ensured strong ownership of the electoral code by all political forces and increased public trust and confidence towards elections. High turnout in the election day, which was visible to all observers in the polling stations, reflecting the degree of public trust towards elections. The high number of international domestic observers was unprecedented in these elections. In order to ensure transparent implementation of the electoral code, Armenia received unrestricted and increasing numbers of international observers from intergovernmental organizations, including OSC ODIR, OSC Parliamentary Assembly, in total about 650 observers, international observers, and 49 Armenian NGOs accredited roughly 28,000 observers in the elections. The efficiency of newly introduced voting authentication devices has been widely acknowledged by all observation missions. Electronic voter identification prevented number of irregularities in these elections. He would like to take this opportunity to thank those participating states who helped Armenia in introducing these new devices. I would also like to recall the important contribution of the OSC office in Yerevan, who co-organized a number of events on electronic voting system last year. The observers well documented that the election day was calm and peaceful, fundamental freedoms were generally respected, contestants were able to campaign without restrictions, and finally, voters were able to exercise their right to uh, a free vote. Uh, one more point, aside from the right to vote, these elections brought positive change in protecting and prom promoting other fundamental freedoms. Newly elected parliament secured inclusive representation of all major minorities, uh, and as a result, Yazidi, Russian, Assyrian, and Kurdish communities get a seat in the parliament. I would use also my right of reply to reflect on some irregularities which was also communicated by NGOs before. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Helsinki Citizens Assembly Vanadzor, to be followed by the Islamic Renaissance Party. Helsinki Citizens Assembly Vanadzor, you Thank have you. the floor. Yeah. Uh, in spite of the claims of the Armenian delegation, the OEC or their observation mission report contains wealth of information on serious problems identified during the parliamentary elections in Armenia. The OEC ODIR stated that, uh, and we can of course take all the parts we are interested in or ignore the other parts, but anyway, uh, the campaign was tainted by credible and widespread allegations of vote buying, pressure on public servants, including in schools and hospitals, and intimidation of voters to vote for certain parties. This contributed to an overall lack of public confidence in the electoral process and raised concerns about voters' ability to cast their votes free, and fair, uh, free of fear of retribution, as required by the OSCE commitments. The voting process was also uh, marred with unlawful involvement of party proxies in the voting and tabulation processes. By the way, here I should mention that uh, a wide majority of the observation missions that uh, the delegate in, uh, indicated was actually presented by parties and there were fake observers who were assisting the proxies at a polling station in an illegal manner. Domestic observers, uh, the actual observers, identified serious violations, most of it, uh, which were noted by the ODR as well. The Re Republican Party owns three times more property, in uh, property and financial assets than all other parties combined, and this initial advantage, coupled with administrative leverages, makes the party basically undefeatable. Uh, public awareness raising efforts uh, done uh, on the election, new election code actually did not reflect on the political consequences of the changes in the voting system, and people were only informed about how to vote, but not the consequences of the voting process. Vote buying corrupted the entire electoral process. Representatives of the Repo uh, ruling party went as far as to argue that vote buying is not a criminal, but a philanthropic act. There were cases of violence during the election campaign period, and the campaigns were built around local money tycoons and their authority, rather than political platforms and policies of the parties. Credible information on pressure and intimidation of employees of medical and educational institu institutions uh, were not actually investigated properly, and all criminal investigations were dismissed. CEC and law enforcement officials did not properly consider reports on electoral violations. The overwhelming majority of reports were deemed groundless and, and dismissed, while those investigated were eventually dropped as well. The efforts by the authorities were directed at silencing and concealing violations rather than investigating them. Specific cases were deemed isolated incidents which did not have an impact on elections, while allegations of widespread violations were deemed vague and false. Electoral violations made it problematic for citizens to vote freely and without pressure. Cases of group voting, as well as attempts to influence voters and issues related to secrecy voting were observed in polling stations. The right uh, to assisted voting was abused to control the voters and basically vote instead of them, uh, instead of helping. The Armenian authorities also refused to invite international NGOs to observe the elections, such as the uh, European Platform for Democratic Elections and NMO, and they argued that there is enough local and international observers. I guess I'll just not take up more of your time. I wish we had the elections that present, uh, were presented by the Armenian delegation. Unfortunately, we didn't. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Islamic Renaissance Party, to be followed by the All Ukrainian Public Organization Civic Network Opora. Islamic Renaissance Party, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, I have to begin with some rather bad news. Whilst we sit here in this meeting, the delegation of Tajikistan, which unfortunately decided to ignore this event due to the fact that representatives of civil society would be taking part, not only did they ignore this event, but they have actually decided to uh, oppress the relatives of the participants of this uh, meeting, and I um, have the sad news that some of our members have had to leave this uh, event due to the hostile uh, measures taken against their relatives by the Tajik authorities. In the 21st century, such barbaric ways of dealing with 
women and children on the mere basis that their relatives are taking part in uh, human rights events in Warsaw is just unacceptable. With respect to elections, I won't repeat what has already been said concerning Tajikistan. There were several speakers who took the floor on this topic, but I would like to raise something which to my mind is very important. Elections are not just a part of human rights, not just a mechanism for the participation of citizens in social life, but they are also a factor for stability and a factor for security, especially in our region in our region where there is a lack of clear mechanisms for citizen participation in election processes. And this forces many people, including young people, to become disillusioned with elections as a mechanism for taking part in public life. And many young people end up turning towards radical or extremist groups as a consequence. Our party has 15 uh, members of the uh, parliament. I was a parliamentarian myself for a number of years. But our party was closed down a number of years ago, and we were labeled extremist and uh, as, as an extremist and terrorist organization. And in fact, there is a growing trend of uh, radicalization in our country. And in fact, in Tajikistan, there are some of our citizens, in fact, more than 2,000 of our citizens have traveled to Syria and Iraq to take part in terrorist activities. But our party was always part of what was considered to be a relatively democratic and stable country in Central Asia, and the constitution of armed groups was a uh, much smaller issue for Tajikistan back then, but unfortunately, now, this concern is at the top of all Central Asian states' concerns. Thank you. On my list is the all-Ukrainian public organization, Civic Network Opora, uh, to be followed by the Committee of Voters of Ukraine. Civic Network Opora, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, besides tragic humanitarian consequences and casualties, Russian aggression in Ukraine undermines the international election standards. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that last Sunday, Russian government held so-called local election in the occupied Crimea. Occupation of the Ukrainian territories, compulsory naturalization of Ukrainian citizens, wide-scale harassment and increasing number of missing people in Crimea. This is the background of illegal election in Crimea so-called election in 2016-2017. Unfortunately, some members of parliaments of OEC participating states took part in illegal PR events under the mask of international observers. And I'm sure it should get an adequate response. To resist the aggressive policy of the Russian Federation, we must focus our continuous efforts on the protection of democratic standards and persistently respond to the worst violation of human rights and fundamental election principles. Counteraction to fake observation mission in election which are supported by undemocratic regimes in their territories or territories of other states should be our another priority. I would also like to mention the internal work plan for electoral reform in Ukraine. Unfortunately, there are many unresolved issues in this direction. Firstly, membership of the Central Election Commission should be reappointed because most of the members had their term of office expired yet in June uh, 2014. Secondly, there is an unfulfilled obligation concerning uh, parliamentary election reform, including the introduction of open list proportional representation electoral system. So, so the Ukrainian has an urgent and present task to provide an adequate regulation for electoral rights of IDPs who had to leave their homes because of armed aggression of Russia. Ukrainian NGOs have developed draft amendments for electoral legislation goal to protect electoral rights of IDPs and their integration in new communities. Besides that, Ukrainian civil society actively works on mechanism promoting gender equality in political and electoral process, as well as equal uh, access to the election process for disabled. We call on the government to support their initiatives and resolve the problem with electoral rights of citizens. Ukrainian Jones also call on the government to continue the efforts towards the certainty of punishment for electoral offenses. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Committee of Voters of Ukraine to be followed by Tarnarom. Committee of Voters of Ukraine, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, today, in listening to the representative of the Central Electoral Commission of the Russian Federation, uh, there was significant ma manipulation. He talked about local elections in Russia of the 10th of September. Um, using electronic statistics, he said that uh, elections took place in Sevastopol of the Occupied Republic of uh, Crimea. The, this kind of manipulation is not acceptable. There is not a single democratic country in the world, not a single international organization uh, that has recognized it, recognized the PR action which uh, Russia is calling a referendum of 2014. And not a single one recognizes the election of the 10th of September either. I'd like to remind a representative of the Russian Federation that yesterday the uh, external uh, affairs services of the European Union uh, recognized that the elections were not valid. The OSCE did not observe the elections of the State Duma nor that of the governor of Sevastopol of the 10th of September and uh, is also taking the position uh, that um, these elections were or could not be considered valid. So it's important to clearly uh, establish the official position of the OSCE where it is clearly stated that the simple uh, carrying out of the election is not acceptable and that's the OSCE position. The influence of the Russian Federation has been stronger than uh, the announcements made. We believe it's very important for the state participants of the OSCE to apply personal sanctions to the organizers of elections in Crimea, particularly those present in this room. Uh, over the last year, we've seen a great number of facts reflecting a worsening of the situation in occupied Crimea, ethnic discrimination, uh, discrimination on the basis of language, uh, problems with freedom of expression, uh, many publications in the Crimean language are being shut down. We're seeing an open genocide on the European continent at the moment. And that's why I would like to emphasize one particular point today, uh, namely that in the official documents of the OSCE, it is necessary to clearly formulate uh, the uh, position on uh, the release of the of Akhmata Chikova um, and the other leaders of the Crimean Tatar people. Thank you. Is Tarna Rom to be followed by the Czech Republic? Tarnarom, you have the floor. Uh, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, and delegates. I represent the Union of Young Roma People in the Republic of Moldova. And there are 32 organizations that are involved in uh, our association. When you wonder where the Roma can take part in elections and electoral processes, we need to, I believe, focus on three key factors which go to show that the percentage of parties in parliament is quite small because even if there's a Roma party, that is established, there's no way they will be elected to parliament. Another essential point is that the areas where Roma people live don't have any electoral commissions, and it's very difficult for them to go and vote because it involves traveling hundreds of kilometers, and uh, that is very difficult, in particular for young people or um, 
elderly people, even if it's only seven kilometers away, it's still a big distance to cover for some people. The parties that are active in the Republic of Moldova require at least 100 and 100 to 101 um, signatures if the for a party be established and parties can never include Roma people because they are afraid that this would have a negative impact on their outlooks and prospects another third and a third thing which we could do together would be to raise awareness amongst the Roma because in order to take part it's important to know what that involves and how to do so. But there are no awareness raising campaigns in the Republic of Moldova. Thank you very much. I hope that we will all manage to improve things in our countries. Thank you. Thank you. With apologies, I'm back. Uh, the next speaker on my list is the Czech Republic to be followed by the Elections Monitoring and Democracy Studies Center. Czech Republic, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Czech Republic Alliance, uh, it's will be the statement delivered earlier by the European Union, and uh, now I would like to add uh, three uh, points uh, in my national capacity. Uh, in our view, first point is, in our view, um, election-related um, activities remain a cornerstone of the Odir's mandate. Uh, so far, the Czech Republic has contributed with uh, its long-term and short-term observers to all OSCE election observation missions um, in 2017. Uh, let me point out also that we stand ready to deploy our observers to participate in all upcoming elections which will take place until the end of uh, this year. Uh, according to our information in uh, some election observation mission, the number of deployed observers was limited uh, due to the lack of nomination by participating states. Therefore, we encourage participating states to increase uh, their contributions uh, to EOMs. Second point, we appreciate the recent, uh, recent agreement uh, with ODIR to evaluate the performance of all Czech long-term observers uh, who participated in uh, the EOMs. In our view, any successful election observation mission is not possible without qualified and uh, professional uh, long-term observers. Therefore, we invite ODI to open a uh, discussion on a general evaluation system for all participating long-term observers. Third and last point, uh, the Czech Republic will organize parliamentary election in October 2017 and presidential election in January 2018. We welcome uh, the OSC decision to deploy the election assessment uh, mission to observe the um, uh, upcoming parliamentary election in my country. The Czech government is prepared to fully cooperate with the mission and implement recommendation included in the mission, uh, mission's uh, final report, if applicable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Elections Monitoring and Democracy Studies Center to be followed by the International Platform Global Rights of Peaceful People Elections Monitoring and Democracy Studies Center. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, election Monitoring and Democracy Center is one of the uh, oldest uh, election mon uh, local election monitoring uh, NGO in Azerbaijan. And uh, for the uh, purpose of this uh, meeting, uh, we prepared assessment paper of the one of the questions in annotated agenda. It's a question of what can be done to further enhance the effectiveness of the follow-up by uh, OSC participating states to ODIR's assessment and recommendations. Uh, uh, with this assessment paper, we found that uh, Azerbaijan, uh, since uh, 2008, uh, not uh, implement any kind of uh, recommendation uh, made by uh, OEC ODIR. And also we found that uh, there is no any uh, other uh, effective implementation of other uh, electoral recommendations. Our uh, matter, uh, our uh, assessment paper have been distributed by uh, uh, documentation desk, and uh, part, uh, participant can uh, assess uh, uh, 
can't access to this uh, document. Uh, I would like to emphasize uh, the main areas of recommendations. One is the uh, uh, impartiality and independence of electoral commission in Azer commissions in Azerbaijan, and by the uh, uh, by, uh, uh, OECO, ODIR, Venice Commission, and also European Court of Human Rights uh, several times found that electoral commission in, uh, commissions in Azerbaijan is not impartial and independent. Uh, second uh, kind of problems which raised in recommendations are uh, candidate registration. Uh, we have very big problem which uh, happens uh, in all uh, the times most of oppositional uh, candidates denied uh, by electoral commissions without reasons and uh, arbitrary manner. Uh, so we have uh, uh, approximately 22 uh, violation judgments by uh, European Court of Human Rights on electoral uh, issue, which uh, consist of one of the third uh, violation uh, judgments of the uh, court's case law in uh, electoral issues. Uh, so it's a very uh, uh, big data uh, in one uh, country, uh, in, in one country manner. Uh, in the conclusion, I would like to recommend to uh, OC uh, that uh, violation of human rights, including violation of electoral right, is not minor, is not occasional issue in Azerbaijan. These violations are uh, systematic. These violations are. Uh, institutional, repetitive, and uh, regular. It means that these violations occur as a uh, as a de facto governmental function, not as a is isolated case. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the International Platform Global Rights of Peaceful oh. People, to be followed by the Fund for Development of Parliamentarianism in Kazakhstan. International Platform, Global Rights of Peaceful People, you have the floor. Mr. Moderator, experts, I am the president of the International Platform, Global Rights of Peaceful People. Our platform was established by normal peaceful people coming from four countries, Hungary, Spain, Italy, and Germany on the 2nd of August 2014. It was a protest against undemocratic elections in Ukraine, which took place under, at gunpoint, the guns of the right sector. We are a non-governmental organization funded by our members and the donations of citizens. Initially, our goal was to support the civilians of Ukraine in their just battle with the uh, nationalistic and neo-fascist forces at play there and with the uh, Ukrainian authorities who came to power following an armed revolution sponsored by the U.S. State Department. Now, our tasks include a much broader range of issues. Uh, including the protection of minorities and the prompt response to bans on the freedom of expression, assembly, and uh, action, uh, demonstrations and against um, censorship, as well as the expansion of NATO and the deployment of additional nuclear weapons in Europe. Currently, we have national branches in 16 countries, and we are preparing to register this year with the United Nations as an advisory body to the uh, Human Rights Commissioner. And we could talk about some of our success stories. We support European human rights and anti-fascist movements and take part in um, demonstrations in commemoration of the 48 innocent people who died in Odessa. We also protect religious minorities. In three years, we have held more than 300 uh, events aimed at defending human rights and fighting against racism, xenophobia, and, and discrimination. We hold meetings with European civil society and student organizations with a view to raising awareness about the violations in Ukraine. And we are also helping gather in European countries humanitarian aid and pharmaceutical drugs, which we then send to the citizens of Donbass. There are also documentary films that we have uh, helped screen about the events in Odessa and in Donbass. In the organize, 
we also have helped organize um, commemoration ceremonies for the victory over fascism in 17 countries. And we would like to point out that our main goals involve breaking down the media embargo which prevents dissemination of knowledge about the real situation concerning citizens in Ukraine. And to conclude, I would like to say that our organization would like to actively cooperate with the OSCE in the framework of all uh, issues that are relevant. Thank you. The speaker on my list is the Fund for Development of Parliamentarianism in Kazakhstan to be followed by the Union of Journalists of Russia. The Fund for Development of Parliamentarianism in Kazakhstan, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, moderator. Zoleth Patalova, uh, the uh, organization, my organization works in Kazakhstan. Uh, we have a strong democracy, uh, full pluralism, honest elections, and uh, countries with young democracies are trying to strengthen their parliamentary system and quality of parties. Now, in the Republic of Kazakhstan, in the adoption of 2002 uh, legislation on uh, political parties, unfortunately, has gone in the other direction. Uh, in terms of registration, financing, and uh, creation of uh, political parties. We're seeing that over the past 15 years, uh, there have been changes in the law of a cosmetic character which have not enabled the full law to be implemented. And the result of this is that there's been, uh, we've seen a reverse in the development of the party system. Uh, we've seen the condemnation of leaders, we've seen uh, the elimination and liquidation of some parties, the co criminal code applying to political parties has been uh, made more severe. Uh, it's been more difficult to develop uh, parties and get citizens into parliament. Uh, the, uh, there is practically no opposition in the parliament. So I would make the following recommendation. Kazakhstan uh, needs to improve its uh, political party legislation particularly with regard to the registration of political parties and the uh, creation and registration of organizations should be brought into line with international practice. The financing laws need to be adapted to be fairer and we should have an open party list system uh, for elections. It's also necessary to improve the implementation of legislation to ensure the full application in practice. The improvement of electoral legislation has not resulted in an improvement in the situation in 26 years in Kazakhstan. The president has only uh, presidential presidential position has been occupied by one person. Uh, there's been no altern altern there's been no alternation in the political uh, party in parliament, and uh, we have seen uh, that this situation will continue without change. So we need open, honest elections and uh, the bringing into line of electoral legislation with international standards, as well as uh, the full application of legislation in practice. Thank you very much. The next speaker on my list is the Union of Journalists of Russia, to be followed by the International Public Fund, Russian Peace Foundation. The Union of Journalists of Russia, you have the floor. Moderator, distinguished participants, ensuring pluralism during election campaigns is a priority for the OSCE's activities, and this involves uh, using national and international media as well. And we are convinced that the elections in September of this year and the referendum of 2014, as well as elections to the local self-government and uh, which were carried out in Crimea, were held in full accordance with international law. The Ukrainians' view on the status of Crimea is that there is only one 
right point of view, one opinion that is legitimate. And I would like to point out that um, the Crimeans don't consider the government in Ukraine to be a legitimate be at the moment. And I would also like to point out that the apart from the election campaign, there are plenty of uh, events which involve civil uh, citizen participation. And for instance, there are social councils, which mean, and in the Russian Federation, there are multiple associations. And it, we generally believe that nobody should be less left behind. Russian journalists not only work hard to ensure that campaigns are uh, fair and transparent and that journalists' rights are expected, but we also work with council, as advisory councils to the authorities, and we carry out some sort of citizen oversight over all sorts of procedures. Civil society organizations receive, establish their own ratings of the uh, voting procedures, and there have been um, actions on take my journalists at multiple levels. But one thing is clear, the participation of civil society in uh, expert advisory councils is a good way of uh, helping the, uh, develop public opinion in Russia and um, raise the profile of the journalist community. Thank you. Thank you very much. My list is the International Public Fund Russian Peace Foundation to be followed by, the in, by an, an independent civil society activist. Russian Peace Foundation, you have the floor. Thank you. The Russian Peace Foundation uh, is joining the conversation where we've been talking about uh, elections more than anything else, but the question of national, regional, and local democracy is also very important. The possibilities available in legislation are not always applied on the ground. Quite often there are protests against this and an example of uh, protest is uh, the second uh, war in the United States between the North and the South. Uh, the process of removing monuments and historical revenge uh, is happening or has happened before our eyes. Democracy at the local regional election is um, diverting or diverging from the national situation. And uh, we've also seen the impact of this at the national level. What's been happening since the election of Trump might divert attention of the historical situations at the local and regional level. And if these contradictions aren't resolved, this could lead to a national disaster. We uh, sincerely hope that the American people can meet this internal challenge, which uh, could be a lot worse than the hurricanes we've seen. The elections are important. The leaders of America criticize uh, the elections in other countries, but that fails to recognize the serious flaws in their own um, presidential election. We've seen uh, the uh, tone that's been used to the electorate in America, and everybody is fed up with this. Thank you. Speaker on my list is an independent civil society activist, Ms. Uh, Shabnam Hudoydodova. Ms. Hudoydodova, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I am an independent civil society activist from Tajikistan. The understanding of democracy needs to be explained to those who uh, live in Central Asia. We aspire to democracy, but unfortunately, uh, democracy is still an elusive dream where we are. Tajikistan is no exception. Democracy in 
Tajikistan involves trampling over human rights. That is interpreted as democratic and in the constitution, all that is done is defined as democratic, but democracy in Tajikistan plants innocent people in prison, in prison on the simple, simply because the government needs results and um, the results obtained tend to be the results of torture carried out against those arrested and civilians are also harassed and this is also democratic. Their private lives are controlled and there are multiple other issues. Things such as when you can get married or have children or whether you can spend an evening in a bar or not all seem to be governed by uh, the, the government and laws are passed to exert such restrictive control and how can this be called democracy? I think that you should think about the definition of democracy and wonder whether our government has really grasped the essence of democracy. Thank you. The list is the Young Citizens Enlightenment Public Union to be followed by the Kazakh Community Association. The Young Citizens Enlightenment Public Union, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Uh, I am Gunel Safarova from Azerbaijan. Uh, not a single state has ever been insured against any of the shortcomings. No doubt there were some gaps and problems in Azerbaijan as well, but in the past. But elections generally are conducted according to the rules in Azerbaijan, and the preparation and voting process for parliamentary elections are technically well arranged in Azerbaijan. And elections are held in accordance with the Election Code of Republic. I have been nominated from the opposition party in recent parliament elections. There was no basis for OSC observation missions not to take part in elections in Azerbaijan. In this respect, this relationship informs more double standards. I want to ask why International organizations and other groups are silent about human rights, about human rights protection. And also sometimes they send several statements about a person to the world for months and makes propaganda. But no mention the fate of hundreds of thousands of victims of war. Fake election of the so-called regime is not recognized internationally provided in Azerbaijan territory of Karabakh. These illegally and fraudulent elections against constitutions, law, and international principles. And some European countries involved as observers to the elections in order to gain legitimacy for illegal elections. Also, this is against Helsinki Final Act. Also, I want to ask from the Armenian representative why we can't talk about the conflict regions. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is the Kazakh Community Association to be followed by the Central Asian and Southern Caucasus uh, Freedom of Expression Network. Kazakh Community Association, you do have the floor. Thank you very much, moderator. Balimaris. Not a single election in Kazakhstan has been taken in accordance with uh, democratic, international democratic standards as uh, understood in the international organizations. 18 million Kazakhs have to uh, regist register a party with at least 40,000 members. Uh, the authorities uh, will claim things, claim that's going better because it's down from 50,000. Uh, it's um, it's compared to Mexico, where you also need 5,000 members, uh, where, but um, their population is much larger. Um, other countries have much lower levels to register a party. We have the Assembly of Peoples of Kazakhstan, which is a kind of hybrid, uh, which can elect uh, nine people to parliament. The 
representatives of the assemblies have uh, two rights to vote, once in the assembly and once in general elections, which uh, is a violation of the right to elect of, of the um, electoral rights. Uh, they, there is an election of 7% uh, for small parties. Um, in Poland, the countries that get over 3% receive uh, subsidy, which enables uh, the support of small parties uh, and uh, encourages uh, pluralism. In Kazakhstan, the authorities said, Nazarbayev said uh, recently that uh, those that don't manage to cross the barrier um, will disappear, and that's a good thing because it roots out the small parties. I'm not sure about that. Uh, the, ex there are tests in uh, Kazakhstan for um, understanding of history and language skills, but the question is who uh, makes these exams? and. Uh, we all know the questions, and we all know the answers to that. I've been in, in Poland and I've been active here. Nobody's asked me about my language skills. Um, Poland, like all other democratic countries, is focused on improving the lives of its citizens. And uh, its focus is on what and for the democracy of this country. So it's necessary to see a change in the electoral system in uh, Kazakhstan so that I, as a Kazakh woman, can take part in the presidential elections. It's very uh, difficult for me uh, to do that um, because I have Polish citizenship. Thank you very much indeed. The next speaker on my list is the Central Asian and Southern Caucasus Freedom of Expression Network to be followed by Azadlik. Central Asian and Southern Caucasus Freedom of Expression Network, you have the floor. Thank you. As I said, I am the president of this organization and I will also be talking about Kazakhstan as my organization is also interested in that region and active there. In 2015, when there were the latest presidential elections in Kazakhstan, I was invited as a term observer for ODIA and I saw a number of interesting things and maybe my remarks might sound strange to you but I think that they are worthy of being pronounced here and taken into account in the future. With me there were partners, I had some partners from Germany, a young lady who uh, was actually not very aware of the situation in Kazakhstan, she didn't know much about it, and she didn't really have any idea about what Kazakhstan was like. And she, when she arrived in Kazakhstan, she was a bit at a loss, whereas I know Kazakhstan, I know the rules, or the code of uh, behavior of the people there. So I felt quite at home and quickly found my bearings and could see what was going on. So my recommendations would be uh, the following, I will come to it up to before seven o'clock one evening we went one morning we went to a voting poll which was still closed but we were let in and then the uh, doors were closed behind us and uh, prior to the opening of the poll station we were able to look around and there was person who came and who condoned all of this and then left. My colleague from Germany thought this was atrocious and that it was a violation of the voting rules. I started to explain to her that there was nothing to worry about here, that there was nothing unlawful. It's just an Eastern country and uh, it had its own traditions, its own rules. And um, often for these events, uh, there are people who come and give their blessing, so to speak, for the events. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that sometimes observers who come from Western countries try to impose their rules on our Eastern countries. And I think that ODIA should, could 
gain from studying the traditions of our eastern countries a bit before sending observers there. Thank you very much. Sibam, the next speaker on my list is Azad Leek to be followed by the European Law Association. Azad Leek, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak. Gunaman Sahid from Azerbaijan. And in the current authoritarian regime, the crimes against civil society um, are different from classic dictatorship on a number of uh, factors. But um, many things haven't changed since uh, Stalin or Hitler. We're seeing the uh, terror carried out by the administration against the population. Uh, for example, if you say that in Azerbaijan there are many political detainees, um, we can see that there are um, many indicators of this. This is the result of operations against uh, civil society. Uh, many organizations have been uh, banned. Um, our publication, uh, Freedom, uh, has been deprived of uh, its um, operations. Many of our freedoms have been taken away and the, um, the administration that we have is uh, applying arbitrary powers um, to uh, bring about this bad situation where we have corruption, we have repression. Uh, recent protests have shown that um, the world is globalizing, but uh, the, the results is very different. I have Can to I interrupt you, you and uh, speaker? pass the floor to the representative Azerbaijan for the point of order, I understand. Mr. Moderator, just, uh, it's not the topic. It's not coinciding yes, with the topic we are discussing. Can I ask you to... Uh, uh, yes, yes. Yes. yes, I'll come on to that. Thank you. I would like to ask to return back to the topic of the discussion uh, that we have in the session today. Thank yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm giving you a bit of context, and uh, this is a process of administrative terror, as I've called it, because uh, the recently we've seen information about upcoming uh, sanctions uh, because of what's been going on. And uh, there's a, uh, I asked you to urge the speaker to speak on the topic. I do kindly ask the speaker to stick to the topic, but uh, the time is out anyway, so you have 15 seconds to conclude your remarks, returning back to the topic of the discussion. Well, I'm talking about the pre-election situation in Azerbaijan. So it's not directly relating to the carrying out of elections, but it is providing the pre-electoral context or for Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, let's hope that uh, after 100 years, maybe um, will have changed. Um, Moderator, it's not coinciding with the topic. Thank you. I think uh, the speech has been concluded. The next speaker in my list is the European Law Association to be followed by Azerbaijan. The European Law Association, you have the floor. Thank you. I'll talk about the electoral system in Armenia. Uh, Armenian electoral system has serious problems in the area of exercising and protecting of the right of free and fair elections, which allow the ruling party and the incumbent president to ensure the uh, desired results and remain in power. The constitutional referendum in 2015 and the parliamentary elections in 2017 
are the best manifestation of these uh, statements. Uh, the systemic problems include abuse of the administrative resource problems of equal access to the resources from parties and absence of effective remedies at domestic level. A number of observation missions during the parliamentary elections this year detected impact on free will of the voters that could have affected the election results. The violations in Terralia includes the vote buying, directed voting, violation of the secrecy of vote, a violation of procedures during summarizing the vote and electronic equipment failures. Nearly 100% of participation of militaries uh, in penitentiaries and psychiatric institutions, as well as in action by electoral commissions and the law enforcement bodies. The complicated nature of the complaining and problems related to the issue of legal certainty make it impossible for non-specialists to bring an electoral complaint. The electoral administration bodies are not effective, independent, impartial, or fair. They are neither formed nor operate in the transparent manner. A good example of this said is that the same members of the Central Electoral Committee appointed by the President in 2011 were elected by the National Assembly after constitutional referendum. The court don't act as uh, effective legal remedy either. The recommendation, it is out of utmost importance to deepen cooperation with OSC ODIR as well as other international experts in view of the fact that this cooperation has made it possible to reflect a number of very serious concerns of uh, domestic experts in OSC report. For example, the amendment uh, to the electoral code which allowed publication of the voter lists, signed voter lists, was result of such cooperation of domestic and international organizations. And of course, uh, I want to say that uh, the very special input was made by EU ambassador, Mr. Piotr Svitalski. Uh, the uh, description of the current situation in democ the democratic elections in more detail can be found in the report of Citizen Observer Initiative. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is Azerbaijan to be followed by the United Kingdom. Azerbaijan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I just wanted to just, I really had a statement, but now I wanted to devote my uh, statement to the issues that was raised by the just uh, election mon monitoring and democracy uh, education center from Azerbaijan. Uh, my young friend from this organization covered just touched some topics that was really interesting to deal with. So the first thing that uh, was talked about it was the implementation of the recommendations by the international organizations by Azerbaijan. Regarding with uh, recommendations by the OSCE ODIR, I would like to emphasize that Azerbaijan uh, implemented partly or fully over 70% of the recommendations by the ODIHR. And just we have managed quite a lot and we have improved our system based on these recommendations. And we uh, just uh, everywhere we just repeated thanks to OSCE ODIHR. So the second issue was the cooperation with international organization regarding with legislation. And uh, my friend was quite young to remember those days that just back to 2003, the current electoral code was adopted. And this election code was adopted and drafted in cooperation with the Events Commission of the Council of Europe and with the ODIHR of the OSCE and just a great job. It was really just a tremendous job that these international organizations just supported us in the just the drafting of these just election code. And uh, he talked about the composition of election commissions. And I would like to emphasize that the composition of the election commissions fully represent the political spectrum of Azerbaijani society. So it was recommended that times by international organizations. So our election commissions are formed with one-third principle. So one-third of all level election commissions are formed, are representing just 
the majority party in the parliament, one third representing minority parties in the parliament, and one third is representing the independent members of the parliament. So all spectrum of the society is well presented in the composition of current election commissions. So the uh, next question that I would like to touch is the candidate registration. And of course, candidate registration is a kind of process that you cannot manage perfectness in this process. Every time it involves thousands of people, that's why we can just observe a kind of just uh, incorrect application or something. And you know, it's not up to the election commissions just to decide this person must be registered or not, because there are certain legislation that we should follow. Uh, I just wanted to give a, just a very uh, brief statistics, sorry for uh, uh, overrunning the time. Just in 2014 municipal elections, 37,564 people applied for registration as a candidate in the municipal elections, and just 98% of them have been registered. And we did our best to register all of them, and whoever corrected their documents, we registered them. <laughs> Uh, but in last parliamentary elections in 2015, 1,407, uh, 457 people registered, just applied for registration, and 86% have been registered. And we found the grounds to register, to manage the registration of those people. And regarding with the re recommendations, my young friend was quite willing to give a recommendation to all international organizations, and we will be very pleased to hear his recommendations back in Baku for future cooperation. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker on my list is the United Kingdom. United Kingdom, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Mr. Moderator, I fully subscribe, of course, to the EU statement, but I want to add a brief word in my national capacity, noting in this regard that I am currently the chair of the OSCE's Human Dimension Committee. Mr. Moderator, I've listened with great interest to the discussion this afternoon. Democracy lies at the heart of the principles and commitments upon which this organization is built. And as we heard yesterday from our distinguished new ODIA director, democracy is a complex and demanding system. We have this afternoon heard a range of concerns about deliberate limitations on the exercise of democratic freedoms and failure to live up to the relevant OSCE principles and commitments. Implementation by all states of shared commitments to uphold human rights and fundamental freedoms rightly remains central to the purpose of this organization. These commitments are inseparable from the security and stability of our region and the well-being of our people. But in a changing world, as Mrs. Robinson said at the beginning of this discussion, the challenges we face are not only traditional ones. Of course, the familiar challenges continue to arise as we see differing levels of implementation of our commitments. But many diplomatic, but diplom all of diplomatic delegations have a strong interest in ensuring and enhancing the implementation of the relevant commitments in a complex and changing world, as you describe. And therefore, I think uh, including our friends from civil society, might be interested to know that reflecting this interest, we will be exploring some of the challenges to democracy both old and new, that have been raised this afternoon in our intergovernmental discussions in the Human Dimension Committee of the OSCE. And the debate this afternoon, uh, Mr. Moderator, will help inform these exchanges, representing, I hope, a welcome link between discussion in this forum and our diplomatic activity in Vienna. Thank you very much. Spasiba. Thank you very much. We indeed look forward to the continuation of these discussions in the Human Dimension Committee. But at the moment, uh, we have seven delegations who express the wish to exercise the right to reply. Uh, with this in mind, and also keeping in mind that we do have to finish the session on time and let our hardworking interpreters go as well. Uh, I would like to allocate a minute for every delegation who would like to exercise the right to reply. The first one in my list is the United States of America. United States of America, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, in light of a couple of the observations that were offered today, 
I'd like to make two points as part of my right of reply. First, as an open democracy, the United States was honored to have the OSC and other election observers witness our elections, and we note with pride the conclusion reached by the OSC that our elections were highly competitive and demonstrated a commitment to fundamental freedoms of expression, assembly, and association. Secondly, it's really important that I reiterate on behalf of the United States that the United States government continues to reject as illegitimate the sham Crimean referendum perpetuated by Russia in 2014. We've said it many times, but it's worth repeating again here. We do not, nor will we ever recognize report Russia's purported annexation of Crimea. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. The next delegation on my list for the right of reply is the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. We are compelled to respond to a number of unfounded allegations made by the United States and Ukraine. In 2018, there will be the presidential elections. Russia intends to fulfill all of its international obligations, including inviting international observers. And we hope that the observation will be unbiased. Russia does not accept accusations of interference in uh, the internal affairs of member states, especially electoral processes. All these uh, allegations were unfounded. There is no evidence of Russian interference in the American or other elections. Such allegations discredit these statements and do not speak in to the credit of um, their authors. We urge other countries to not interfere in the internal affairs of other states, and we believe that that is one of the principles of the Helsinki Final Act. Another principle is the right of a nation to self-determination. The referendum which took place in 2014 in the Crimea was the exercise of this right to self-determination, and it took place in full accordance with international law. And finally, we welcome the serious relationship with the uh, of the United States um, t and ODEA oh and the observation which took place in 2016, which showed a lot of shortcomings in the uh, U.S. And we hope that the U.S. will work thoroughly to address these flaws in accordance with the OSCE principles. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on my list is Kazakhstan. I kindly encourage all delegations to stick to the time limit. Uh, thank you. Thank you, dear chairman. I would like to put a proposal uh, to, to, uh, to discuss in future the issue of non-formulating the shortcomings by the mission of the OSC ODIR, which contradict to the provisions of the constitution of any country. So then, in the parliament, there are uh, parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, there are three independent political parties, Norotan, Akjol, and Communist People's Party of Kazakhstan. Uh, the chief of the mission of the OSC ODIR, Dan Everts, uh, said about the law on elections of Kazakhstan is pr practically perfect law. So when we say about the voters uh, of the assembly, so they really have two voices in this matter, but it is in compliance with the uh, two Venice documents. As for 7%, so Liechtenstein, for, inst for instance, Turkey, have the barrier more than 7%. And the last, uh, concerning the checking of the health of the candidate to the parliament. It's only in our constitution that the norms of the uh, president, maybe a uh, president, maybe not a president because of the state of his health. And this norm is only the addition uh, of this norm. Uh, and as for Bali, I will tell. Uh, be, a, uh, be a citizen of our country, and then you may be a, a candidate to the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, delegation to exercise the right of reply is Armenia. Armenia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I thank Armenian NGOs for their interventions on the parliamentary elections in Armenia. We can debate endlessly on achievements and setbacks of these elections, but it's difficult to reject that there was a significant progress. Every citizen of Armenia can find its name on electoral lists, both before and after voting. So, votes 
of people matter, even though if there are some allegations of vote buying. Now let me uh, come to the point made by Mr. Ioannisian, who made a comparison between Armenia and other countries in electoral process, processes. We have been building democratic society not because we want to be seen better than someone else, particularly if this someone else is hereditary regime with no elections. Democracy is something based on our needs, not on our conflict perceptions. Thank you. Thank you. The next delegation on my list is Spain. Spain, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, moderator. I'd like to revert to the mention that was made by the public institution on electoral legislation of Russia with regard to the comment made on the referendum in Catalonia. To inform you that the referendum referred to is legal and is um, against the rule of law in the Spanish state. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next delegation on my list is Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to exercise the right of reply on the issues uh, raised here about Azerbaijan and very shortly. Um, I have uh, one opinion on the Azadlik, which is raised here. Uh, Azadlik got dozens of grants from the government until 2014. I wonder if they could raise these issues on those years, as they also evaded from the tax, uh, and they had very big problems on this. And I think they couldn't criticize the government in this way because on those day, years they got dozens of grants. Second, Azadlik is unable uh, to print since the financial directors appeared in contact with the leader of Fatula terrorist organizations. So this is the reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next delegation on my list is Latvia. Latvia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So there's uh, that the right uh, to vote is an integral part of a citizenship. Uh, Latvia has on several occasions eased the naturalization legislation. Uh, current framework provides every opportunity for applicants to acquire citizenship. Exam can be done in as little as in two hours and process is very simple. Whether to use this opportunity is an act of individual will. No one can be forced into citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. The last delegation on my list is Canada. Canada, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. In light of some of the comments exchanged during the session, I feel it necessary to reiterate that Crimea remains an integral part of Ukraine, and as such, Canada has not recognized and will not recognize the legitimacy of Russian elections that have taken place there and that might take place in the future, just as we have never recognized Russia's illegal annexation of Ukraine's autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. It goes without saying that we, we do not recognize the legitimacy of any officials chosen in such illegitimate proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes the uh, list of delegations who wish to exercise the right to reply. We have several minutes remaining and I would like, I am delighted to be able to pass the floor for the couple of very brief concluding remarks to the two introducers who opened the session as well. We will start with Mr. Sergei Danielenko. Uh, for and I would allocate two minutes for each of the introducers. Sergey Andreevich, please two minutes. Thank you, dear colleagues. I would like to thank all those who took the floor. A uh, lot was brought to our attention at the national level and uh, about international issues as well. And I think that we need more observation. And if you speak about 500 or five observers, well, I would be in favor of 500, of course. We need to cooperate with internal uh, electoral procedures and um, better implement things at home. I would like to thank the uh, European Association of uh, Electoral Commissions and in particular, uh, well, it is headed by my friend Alexei and the association enables us to introduce new technologies uh, and we can share experiences and uh, relating to those technologies. It would be nice to hear fewer 
condemnations of elections which actually take place in uh, good conditions with uh, thousands and thousands of people uh, taking part. And there have been several elections in Crimea, both at the municipal level and the uh, republic level. Then in, as the delegate of the Russian Federation, What's the logic behind these allegations concerning the American elections and Russian interference? Russia allegedly interfered in the presidential elections when, in fact, the present president, since the president was elected, the relations between two states were So where's the logic? Thank you very much. The floor for concluding remarks to Ms. Sivilina Alexieva. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, I'll start in a shocking, non-traditional way. Uh, well, the famous uh, Udi Allen said, we stand today at a crossroad. The path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other leads to total extinction. Let us hope we have the wisdom to make the right choice. Of course, the tragedy of this dilemma is very intensified, and this is not the situation now, but let us be wise. So, the key is, I'll emphasize once again, in closer cooperation between us, state organizations, civil society organizations, international organizations. Of course, we see that as citizens, we fight for our rights to elect and to be elected uh, without discrimination, any exclusion, any violence. We fight for good governance, more transparency, accountability of governing bodies, inclusion of civil society organizations in the decision-making process. As citizens, we fight for the development of democracies in our countries. As representatives of institutions of different participating states, we understand it is indisputable. We are to ensure the right of our citizens uh, to political participation, i.e. we are to implement our commitments already taken. And of course, the role of OSC and ODIR here is essential in assisting participating states in strengthening the democracy through, um, let's say, through uh, its um, election observation missions um, covering pre-election, election, and post-election uh, period in the same manner in all involved states based on principles of independence, impartiality, and professionalism in strengthening the role of OSC ODIR in promoting democracy. Let us be wise for our citizens' well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have very little to add to these inspiring words. Uh, apart from thanking all of you for a vibrant discussion today, I thank also the interpreters who assisted us greatly. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to just say that I, I have believe that we all pursue the same goal, vibrant democracy, genuine democratic elections, and I can only second what has been just said, the key is a closer cooperation for the sake of our common security. Thank you very much, and with this we close the session today. Thank you.